kind of a rapid review of alcohol pharmacotherapy. And I've got, um, should, should have enough for everybody. So these are just copies of the, um, <coughs> of the slides for you to take notes on if, uh, or you know, make any comments or questions. Because our time is limited, um, I think it's going to be tough to do a lot of discussion, but I urge you to, you know, talk to me afterwards, call me, email me, whatever, and um, we'll do our best. Um, Joan, there's a... There's a seat here, Joan, yeah, if you'd like. But I'm not going to stay. I'm just going to pass around the attendance. Okay. You're not staying? Oops. You really, I'm really, really hurt. Okay. Okay. Um, so the focus of this is pharmacotherapy. We're not going to be really, really covering... A lot of uh, epidemiology, neurobiology, um, psychosocial aspects of treatment, um, et cetera. And that's just the uh, limitations of what we have. Um, so, um, so let me just start off with a little bit about screening. And um, screening is really more of an issue for, I think, our non-mental health colleagues because often they don't have a lot of time to be um, doing an extensive alcohol um, and other substance use disorder um, assessment on patients whom they see in a general medical setting. Um, sometimes even in general mental health settings, unfortunately, you know, people just don't really check very carefully for alcohol and substance use unless that's their orientation and their and their focus, um, and it's really pretty remarkable how extruded um, substance use disorders are, even in 2019, from broad mainstream of, of mental health. Um, and many psychologists and psychiatrists simply don't treat alcohol and substance use, which, and it would be very odd to consider them not treating mood disorders or anxiety disorders or thought disorders. but. Substance use disorders are, for you know, whatever reason, often carved out, and there are many historical um, reasons for that which we can't get into. But obviously, um, you know, alcohol use has harms, and, and there's a lot of very interesting new literature debating the exact degree of harm that comes from it, the exact degree of alcohol use. So. Um, in general, it's understood that there's a linear relationship between more alcohol and more harm, but there has also been um, a good deal of controversy about the benefits of low uh, to moderate levels of alcohol use uh, because of studies done uh, a couple of decades ago that seemed to show some protective benefits in terms of cardiovascular health. Those um, benefits have been severely questioned in some recent research in the past year or two, um, and then some of the questions uh, challenging that there's any benefit have also been challenged. There's something I just saw yesterday or today I haven't even had a chance to read yet. That's another re-examination of potential benefits of low to moderate alcohol use. But the bottom line is alcohol, alcohol in addition to everything else causes inflammation and cancer. Uh, so, and the more alcohol you drink, the more inflammation and cancer there's going to be in addition to all the harms attendant to acute intoxication, withdrawal, uh, the, the psychosocial, behavioral aspects of alcohol. So coming back to screening, this is just a reminder about what's a standard drink, roughly 12 to 14 grams of alcohol, slightly different in Europe and the United Kingdom. They talk about units of alcohol, um, but they also have a standard drink concept. And I think you probably all know by now that 12 ounces of beer and five ounces of like 12% wine. The beer, by the way, is 5% beer, not the 7, 8, 9, 10, um, uh, you know, the double IPAs, uh, et cetera. So, but these are low, low alcohol beer, 12 ounces, 5 ounces of uh, wine, 1.5 ounces of 40% uh, alcohol um, or uh, 80, uh, 80 proof. Um, that's all one standard drink. And the recommended limits, and, and now this all, these limits predate all this recent evidence about you know, any alcohol being more harmful than no alcohol. So all of the limit stuff comes from 
the United States Department of Health and Human Services, and it's based on epidemiological data that seeks to assess some cut point, which by its definition ends up being kind of arbitrary, but it's really meant to create sort of a, I forget what the term is, the responder curve, you know, where you figure out at what point do you get more of whatever you're looking for, more of an outcome than below that point. And with alcohol, the best that U.S. Department of Health and Human Services has been able to arrive at in the last 10, 15 years are daily and weekly limits. The weekly limits are more useful in assessing the um, biological harms that come from alcohol. Um, and those limits are, the weekly limits are no more than seven uh, standard drinks per week for women and for uh, folks, uh, for those of us, um, for, for, for older individuals, uh, it's also no more than seven. But for um, younger males, uh, under 65, it's been up to 14 standard drinks a week. So seven and 14, again, for women and folks over 65 in general, um, uh, at 14 for, uh, for men under 65. That's a weekly limit. Um, daily limits also exist, but those are more in terms of categorizing daily use as being um, hazardous or not. Meaning again that daily use above these levels is associated with hazards um, and is also associated with the likelihood of actually having an alcohol use disorder. So it's um, a, a, a single question screening uh, question has arisen from uh, research done on these limits. Uh, coming back again to the weekly limits, you know, I mentioned there's a cut point and what's beyond the cut point. If you drink more than 14 standard drinks or seven standard drinks um, per week, what is, what, what is worse? Um, and there are significantly higher levels of uh, medical illnesses, uh, psychiatric disorders, trauma, um, and uh, other medical harms above these weekly limits. In terms of the daily limits, asking for daily limits is really probably the quickest, cheapest, easiest way to screen for potentially um, hazardous and harmful alcohol use. The term hazardous can be used to refer to alcohol use that is not necessarily alcohol use disorder, which is in the harmful category of use. Hazardous means you're at risk. You're at risk for a greater incidence of bad things happening to you, medical illnesses. Um, and the screening question, one that's been validated, and I don't, I'm sorry, I didn't include the citation for this, but there have been a couple of large studies looking at the single question alcohol and the single question drug screen. And the single question alcohol screen is asking a patient whom you're encountering if you don't have time for other questions about alcohol is, how many days in the past year have, has there been a day uh, for women where you've had um, four more drinks in a single day? Uh, so more than three, four or more for women is considered a day of hazardous, heavy, at-risk, or risky drinking. For men, how many days in the past year has there been uh, a day where you had five or mo um, more drinks in one day? Um, and if the, question, the answer to the question is more than zero, then you need to ask more questions about alcohol use. And you know, whenever I talk to people about this, um, especially folks in you know, the predominant age range here, is people say, well, you know, everybody we know, or lots of people we know, you know, drink more than that. And that may be true. Still in all this, is, these are epidemiologically derived um, thresholds. And they're useful. This question, the single question screen, is obviously much more sensitive than it is specific. But it will pick up probably 80 to 85 percent of people who actually have an alcohol use disorder. Uh, but it'll also overly include a whole bunch of people who don't have an alcohol use disorder who just like to drink a lot occasionally. Um, so uh, we talked about the, I've already mentioned this, so I'm not going to mention, and this is just sort of, uh, the next couple of slides are just sort of conceptualizations using the Audit C, which is the VA um, standard screening measure. The audit is a 10 question uh, screening tool developed by the um, um, 
World Health Organization, Thomas Babor, um, to determine risk for having an alcohol use disorder. And I kind of don't get it. I know, I, I guess I'm not enough of a psychometrician because it always seemed weird to me to have a 10, well, the audit sees just three questions. It's the consumption questions, one, two, and three of the 10 question audit. But the 10 question audit, which is meant to rank folks in terms of the likelihood that they actually have an alcohol use disorder, I always thought it was kind of weird seeing as how the DSM-5 criteria for alcohol use disorder, there are only 11 of those. So you might as well just kind of do a diagnostic Go through all 11 criteria and make a diagnosis. But anyway, the, uh, the audit is, is what it is, and, and this um, slide just shows that at different levels of positive responses, you know, what, that, what might that trigger? If they're low, just health promotion, hey, keep on not drinking. Um, if they're moderate risk on the audit, and again, the audit C, are, these are, the first few questions are, Again, consumption, like how many days do you drink, how many drinks do you have on a typical day, that kind of thing. If they have somewhat higher score, then basically the higher the score, the more you do, ranging all the way from a brief intervention. And there's been lots of studies on brief interventions, um, unfortunately, many of whom, many of which basically show it doesn't do a whole lot. But uh, still in all, that's a recommendation. If they're more severe, we do more. And if they have a use disorder, we offer pharmacotherapy. Um, the, and these are just, I'm not gonna go through these, these are just examples of brief interventions. I'm including this just for completeness, um, using this to guide treatment, but basically we're gonna reserve treatment um, for people who have a use disorder. And uh, Mike went over this last week um, there are 11 criteria. I think conceptually it's, it's important to get the fact that nine of these are all behaviors that basically all are markers of loss of control over you. So you're using longer than you intended, more than you intended. Bad things happen and you're still using. Um, and these criteria are of course the same for every, every one of the use disorders. Um, the last two are, are highlighted in red, and those are pharmacological criteria. Um, and those two, tolerance and withdrawal, are the two components of the, the concept of pharmacological, also known as physical or physiological um, dependence. And it's basically two sides of the same coin, the same things that, that make you get tolerant, uh, or the, the, the same phenomena that indicate tolerance. Um, are also the phenomena that lead to withdrawal. So tolerance is simply neuroadaptation. It's part of the homeostasis that we all um, experience when we are constantly exposed to you know, some exogenous ligand that's entering our uh, nervous system. And so if that ligand is something that mimics our natural neurotransmitter system um, or, or stimulates that neurotransmitter system, then we're going to downregulate that neurotransmitter system and everything that's part of that. So making the neurotransmitter, um, the genetic changes that lead to making the proteins for the neurotransmitter, making proteins for receptors, making the secondary messengers, um, making all the effectors of response to those um, signaling uh, molecules, all that gets downregulated. And then when we stop getting that exogenous ligand in our nervous system when we stop the alcohol or whatever it is, then we're left with this neuroadapted state and that's what we experience. And it has all the manifestations of, of withdrawal, both subjective, um, the ones that are not observable readily um, as we examine patients, and, and then of course objective ones, which for some drugs like alcohol and opioids we have, but for many other drugs we don't have good peripherally observable signs of withdrawal. And, and interestingly, and it just takes me back um, uh, 40, 50 years ago when I was in um, medical school, um, 45 years ago, there were, you know, there's serious, um, you know, questioning about is cocaine addictive? Because people were so used to thinking of addiction as when you go into withdrawal. And people who stop cocaine obviously go into withdrawal, but it, 
it actually took Frank Gavin at Yale to write an article describing cocaine withdrawal. Eventually, that became incorporated in what now is the you know, DSM criteria for withdrawal, but acknowledging the subjective, that these are central, not peripheral kinds of manifestations that withdrawal syndrome. But for alcohol, we've got lots of peripheral uh, as well as central. So we've made a diagnosis of alcohol use disorder. When do we uh, consider pharmacotherapy? And my answer is always. Um, because if somebody's got a problem with alcohol, it's bad enough for them to have come to you, then why would you withhold any evidence-based thing that could help them? Um, it takes a lot for people to come to substance abuse treatment, believe me. I mean, our, our biggest, um, you know, Tawheed, um, I think, has, has, um, has like, but Tawheed on the consult service is aware of that. You know, it's, for folks to get to Mike's um, opioid treatment program, they really have to go through a lot to overcome the barriers, our internal barriers, and then external barriers to seeking treatment. So if somebody's coming, you know, asking for help for alcohol, to me it seems really wrong um, and kind of malpractice not to offer medications. Um, obviously, the, you know, the more severe their disorder is, the more likely you are to not withhold some you know, integral part of, um, of treatment. Um, and we can choose a number of targets. Today I'm not going to, we don't have time for us to be, you know, discussing withdrawal treatment, which is super important, and, but it comes down kind of to one word, benzodiazepines, uh, and then they're, they're, there's quibbling in terms of symptom triggered versus around the clock. Um, that argument's been going back and forth for decades, um, although you know, most people would probably feel that symptom triggered is, is better. Um, also, forever, you know, there have been uh, arguments over the years about are there, is there something we can use other than benzodiazepines and um, at Stan uh, investigator at Stanford on blocking, can't remember his name right now. Oh, yeah. yeah, you know, has come up with some very reasonable um, uh, approaches using an anticonvulsants. I would still say though that, you know, if you don't use a benzodiazepine and, and something bad happens during alcohol withdrawal, it's going to be on you. Uh, it's just, benzodiazepines are so much simpler and more predictable than uh, any other drug that really takes a special reason, I think, not to use what is kind of established as the uh, gold standard treatment for uh, uh, withdrawal. But other than um, withdrawal, the other major uh, parts of alcohol use disorder are what happens at 99% of the time that one has alcohol use disorder, which is not when you're in withdrawal, but when you're trying to reduce or stop, or you've stopped and you're trying to maintain um, absence of, of return to alcohol use. And so what do we have available? We have some FDA-approved medications naltrexone in two forms, acamprosate and disulfiram. And then what, what else do we have? Uh, we've got some non-FDA, and I, bold, I bolded, uh, by the way, naltrexone just because it's in some ways the simplest. And we'll get back to, you know, is there a first-line drug for, for alcohol use disorder? And then I bolded to period just because it way out, it far outweighs the evidence for the other, the consistency of the evidence. Uh, as compared to um, baclofen and gabapentin um, and other drugs. There are a bunch of others as well. So you've got a patient. Um, let's just say this is a 57-year-old male patient. Tells you drinking, you know, he's drinking heavily and he wants to help. Um, uh, and he wants help. So would you consider using medications? Let's say, let's say that he's, you've made a diagnosis of alcohol use disorder. Um, so, probably, um, given what I've just said, there may be hesitancy in saying, no, you, you wouldn't consider using medications. But <laughs> let's say you are using, you know, you're considering using medications. Well, then what else, you know, what else are you going to want to know? Um, and I should have asked you, what, what are you going to know before I went to the next slide? But there's a bunch of things that you're going to want to know as you're thinking about medications, because um, let me just jump ahead. We don't have any predictors for who's going to respond to what alcohol use disorder medication. 
And that's so different from every other as, you know, branch of psychiatry, right? That, that we don't have good predictors for no, it's not different. It's, it's exactly the same as every other part of psychiatry. We don't have any predictors for any antidepressants, anti-anxiety medications, mood stabilizers. What we have are a thorough knowledge of adverse effects and how to tailor medications for you know, bad things that we want to avoid. Like if somebody is having insomnia, we don't want to give them a medication that's stimulating or if they're... Um, too th skinny. We don't want to give them a medication that'll make them lose more weight. Or conversely, um, if they're somewhat overweight, we don't want to give them medication that'll make them gain weight, uh, etc. We have ways to, but beyond that, there we simply don't have any reliable predictors. Uh, I just want to remind everyone that um, Steve Leesky and I are the uh, PIs of a uh, at the San Francisco site of a. The PRIME CARE study, which is a pharmacogenomic study, genetic study um, for um, antidepressant response. And if you're, if any of you are involved with starting new folks on antidepressants, please contact me or my um, lab manager, Brooke, um, because uh, Steve and I are trying to get folks into the study, which basically does genetic testing up front as a way to, to see the purpose of the study is to see whether genetic testing, in fact, does help with, um, if, you, if you use the information from genetic test to decide what antidepressant you start, does that make a difference in terms of remission rates? Um, but coming back to this, we don't know, we can't, we, we don't have good ways of predicting who will respond to which alcohol use disorder medication, but there are things that we can ask to sort of help us point in a direction with some medications versus others. So uh, this gentleman is still drinking. Um, he says he's drinking heavily. We want to know, is he still drinking? Um, he has not yet stopped. So of the medications that I listed before, and you can look at your handout to remind you what they were, which one can't we use right now? Uh, what alcohol use disorder medication can't we give him if he's still drinking? Yeah. Um, and um, I'll, we'll get back to disulfiram effects. So now he tells you he wants to reduce, not stop. So which medication can't we use? It's the same one we just I can't use disulfiram. Um, and by the way, these questions are meant to help create a branching, sort of an algorithm of you know, decision points that help in deciding which, you know, wh what you're considering. He's on opioid analgesics. What, what medication can't we use? Naltrexone. Naltrexone, either in the oral or the extended release form. Um, and um, uh, it's, um, all right, so that, this is yet another variable that we need to, okay, his liver function tests are elevated to more than three times the upper limit of the norm. While this is not an, a, a precise contraindication, what medications would we want to be more careful with knowing that they are hepatically metabolized and might pose a greater risk for adverse effects uh, in someone with a really bad liver? Naltrexone and which, which other one of the ones we've talked about? I'm sorry? Actually, acamprosate, gabapentin, baclofen, topiramate are all renally cleared, thankfully. And, but disulfiram is not. And um, disulfiram also has this uh, asterisk of, it, it, there's a very rare, very low incidence, but um, something we need to be aware of, of fulminant hepatic necrosis. Probably, I'm just throwing out a number less than 100,000, one in every 100,000 people exposed, but I honestly don't know what the exact number is. Um, but disulfiram, like naltrexone, has a much more common effect of elevating transaminases, and that probably occurs in about one in 200 people. And then, But they're also hepatically metabolized, so if somebody's got really bad liver, you, that's a concern, but it's not really a contraindication, but it's a concern 
make you want to think about um, renally cleared drugs. But then now, now you find out that his um, EGFR and creatinine clearance um, indicate uh, moderately severe renal function impairment, and which medications are you now concerned about? And we just mentioned them a moment ago. And which ones were they that are renally cleared? The Campersate. Yep, topiramate, gabapentin, baclofen. Um, it doesn't mean you can't use them, but for example, for topiramate, if you look in the prescribing information, it says for folks with um, creatinine clearance less than 70 um, and whatever EGFR um, correlates to that, you cut the dose in half. So cutting the dose in half is a, use, is a reasonable metric to use with the renally cleared medication. doesn't mean you can't use them, but you want to be clear. So let's just look at the big picture. There's an enormous underutilization of... Um, of medications for alcohol use disorder, and um, it, even though it's only one of the th it's one of the only three substances of abuse for which we've got really good, by that I mean you know widely acknowledged and FDA approved um, medications because we certainly don't have them for cocaine, methamphetamine, cannabis, hallucinogens, um, what you know, what whatever other drug you want to mention, we don't have medications that are um, known to be efficacious. Uh, yet, despite this, there's really very little use, and and the use is increasing, but it's still um, humbling how bad. Um, so, a 2012 study: only eight percent of the adults in the U.S. with alcohol use disorder were treated with um, with alcohol use disorder medications. Um, and this has, uh, this has been, um, th this also held up in um, uh, VA studies. And I didn't cite this, but um, I was a co-author on a, a study that came out um, in 2015 that looked, um, and I posed this question to the health uh, services researchers down at uh, Palo Alto uh, at the VA, uh, and I, I formed, you know, gave them this hypothesis that, hey, I bet if we looked at people, veterans with co-occurring disorders who had like alcohol and schizophrenia, alcohol and PTSD, alcohol and major depressive disorder, and we did a deep dive into the national um, pharmacy database, I bet you'd find that way big majority of all those folks were being treated for the non-alcohol co-occurring condition, but that very few people are going to be treated for the alcohol. And the purpose of this was to get rid of the hypothesis that people didn't have access to mental health prescribers. Um, and that's why they weren't getting. And so sure enough, you know, like 80 plus percent of people with depression, PTSD, schizophrenia were getting medications for depression, PTSD, schizophrenia. And like 5%, you know, 8%, 9%, whatever, were getting medications for alcohol. It's just really mind boggling and frustrating and there's we don't have time to get into why that is I'm sure you have your own you know thoughts about that but alcohol use disorder treatment isn't um, simple just like depression um, anxiety thought disorder treatment isn't simple because people with alcohol use disorder have all different there are probably lots of different kinds of alcohol use disorder. And just like with every DSM-5 diagnosis, our diagnoses are really kind of crappy. With um, substance use, it's a little bit, there's a little bit more validity because the behaviors are, are more observable in some ways um, and we can quantify you know, how much people use and stuff like that. But boy, our psychiatric diagnosis, even in 2019, is phenomenological. You know, do you have three of, you know, it's, it's like the old Chinese menu. You have three of these and two of those. Well, then you have this disease. So it's all phenomena based on self-report, sometimes observation, but it's not on etiology. Uh, we say, it's, it'd be like if, say, you know, medical diagnosis was you have water in your lungs rather than there's pneumococcus that's producing this inflammation that's drawing water into your lungs. We're at the water in your lungs um, stage with some minor exceptions but unfortunately that's true and with even with alcohol there are many different types of alcohol use disorder um, and 
apart from etiologic differences, we can just talk about you know, phenomenologic differences uh, uh, and uh, co-occurring problems. So what medications, what diseases, what other diseases do people have? Um, there's some other uh, variables that we can look at. Um, but different alcohol use disorder medications present different risks and benefits given some key characteristics that we can identify. The really important stuff, though, is not so much what characteristics allow us to use a medication safely, which is mostly what we're talking about today, but what characteristics allow medications to be more, used more effectively, which we're really poor at identifying, and I don't have any great answers for today, but we'll talk about just a couple of ideas. So coming back to medications, and again, today's lecture is not intended to really go into exhaustive sort of neurobiological descriptions and explanations of, of how these medications work. But one of the many reasons that alcohol use disorder is heterogeneous is because in different people, different neural systems might be affected differentially. Because so many um, central nervous system uh, networks and pathways are affected by alcohol. Alcohol really has these ubiquitous effects on, um, but we've got a seat over here if you, if it make you more comfortable. So dopamine is elevated in the nucleus accumbens. Um, op when we drink alcohol, beta endorphin is released, which then hits um, opioid receptors um, in the midbrain, which then leads to dopamine release uh, in its own. Um, Obviously, you're all familiar with the GABAergic effects of alcohol, that alcohol affects um, aspects of the uh, benzodiazepine GABA chloride ion channel complex and uh, related systems. Glutamate, which you can think of in some ways as the opposite of GABA, so glutamate, an excitatory amino acid uh, neurotransmitter, is upregulated. So when we, when we drink, it has GABAergic effects, so we tend to downregulate GABA chronically over use. When we drink, it blocks GABA to some degree, so we tend to upregulate GABA over the course of chronic use. And so after a while, if we try to stop drinking, we have a hypogabaergic and a kind of a hyperglutamatergic state. But there's so many other neurotransmitter systems, and I'm just listing them here, you know, nicotinic cholinergic, that's thought to be the mechanism that varenicline, Chantix, might have some benefit in alcohol use. Serotonergic, noradrenergic, cannabinoid systems are involved, the um, other systems. Um, and just as, this is sort of a very oversimplistic glimpse at how some of these neurotransmitter and um, uh, signaling system uh, effects can um, uh, are, are linked to some of the medications that we use. So um, the phenomenon, so reward or, so achieving reward or avoiding dysphoria or withdrawal or responding to impulsivity can be thought to be targeted by a number of different medications. And um, I actually need to add a medication that we're doing research with here right now, N-acetylcysteine. Uh, to this list, um, anacylcysteine um, has uh, glutamate modulating effects which um, appear to be useful in, in addiction, including alcohol. But um, I'm not going to go through this again in detail, but I just list which medications are addressing or thought to address which of these um, systems. And one thing I want to point out, because it gets to a way of um, typology, of, of typing um, the uh, large population of, um, of patients uh, with alcohol use disorder is um, a, a way to attempt to predict response in different patients by attempting to assess whether they are reward alcohol users or relief alcohol users, which are this, it's a dichotomous construct which probably isn't entirely valid and most people are probably some of both, but when you ask patients, and I try to do this when I'm assessing, you know, are you drinking primarily to get you know, fun, excitement, stimulation, pleasure, reward, 
or are you drinking primarily to get away from uh, dysphoria, distress, anxiety, traumatic stress memories, insomnia, depression, etc., which could be conceptualized as relief. Now, everybody kind of becomes a relief drinker, ultimately meaning relief from withdrawal, but that's different from relief from some more endogenous kind of dysphoria or bad feeling. And people often tell you they started out as reward drinkers and they became relief drinkers, but again, they may be referring more to just the withdrawal, relief from withdrawal, not relief from some underlying PTSD-related or depression or insomnia-related problem that they've had all their lives uh, because they were sexually molested as children or they had some other horrible uh, childhood adverse effect or they're neurobiologically compromised for genetic reasons. Um, so that can help. It's thought, and there's um, increasing attention to are they their predictable ways of characterizing individuals along that kind of dichotomous divide and then targeting let's say, drugs that target the reward system for the reward drinkers and drugs that target um, the dysphoria, um, that target reducing dysphoria to address the relief drinkers. And just exemplars of those two approaches are naltrexone, which is an opioid agonist and therefore reducing the opioidergic and then downstream from that the dopaminergic effect of alcohol, so reducing the incentive salience, the reward salience of alcohol, both as you think about drinking and also as you consume alcohol. Naltrexone reduces both craving as well as consumatory pleasure in many, but not all, people who use alcohol. And then something like topiramate or campersate down modulating, downward modulating, glutamate, reducing distress, dysphoria, anxiety, etc. So just something to think about. Um, this is kind of early along, and, and these are really, really, as you can guess, really crude kinds of dichotomies that don't adequately describe the complexity of humans. But, but without making attempts at that kind of dichotomization, we're just left with, you know, sort of a amorphous blob of the population of people with alcohol use disorder and in an undifferentiated way providing treatments. Putting those sorts of predictors aside, though, I'm going to come back to using some of the variables that I mentioned earlier as a way to help us select which medications uh, we use. So what are the effective alcohol pharmacotherapies? Again, um, this is the same as the first slide, uh, but slightly longer list, again, the same FDA approved and the non-FDA approved. And then these are some of the variables that we we're referring to earlier with the case. Um, is somebody already absent or not? Are they on opioids or not? Do they have liver or renal disease or not? What's their goal? What do they want? To, do they want to stop drinking? Do they just want to reduce their drinking? Um, and then, you know, numerous other uh, variables involved, um, and I'm, I'm not, I didn't list here the, you know, other potential predictors like um, reward relief or what is their serotonin transporter gene uh, like or their OPRM1 gene or their GRIC gene or there are m many other putative predictors, um, but we're not in a position to make much clinical use of them. Uh, so these are some of the possible predictors. Gender, males may be responding to naltrexone a little bit more. Craving, maybe more craving again, more naltrexone. Family history, uh, again with uh, naltrexone. Family history, early onset uh, drinking. Sweet liking has been identified as a possible phenotype for predicting naltrexone. Uh, again, getting to the reward salience issues. Um, is somebody absent? If somebody's absent when you start them on a medication or, or any treatment for alcohol, they're going to do better, as you would expect. That, but that's actually borne out in clinical trials. If you start at a point when somebody's already stopped drinking, they're going to do better. Um, their capacity to adhere, which affects, you know, do you give them a once a month injection or, a, or two pills three times a day like a campersate, which 
I actually started somebody on our campus at yesterday for the first time, I think, in I don't know how long. But I heard it, it just seems like an impossibly difficult. If I can't remember where I took an antihypertensive once a day, like, how, you know, how do people remember two pills three times a day? Um, so let's just talk about the uh, medications briefly. Disulfiram, um, I think you probably all know, as indicates in the second, uh, in the first and second paragraphs, that acetaldehyde inhibition, which, so alcohol, we drink alcohol, it, it gets converted very rapidly to acetaldehyde, which almost immediately gets broken down um, into acetate and then almost immediately into carbon dioxide and water, and we breathe and urinate it out. Um, but if you block the uh, acetaldehyde dehydrogenase, you build up acetaldehyde, which is super toxic, makes people super sick, get flushed, vomit, it's awful. Um, so um, interestingly enough, double-blind placebo-controlled studies show no benefit over placebo. Now, why would that be? What do you think, when somebody takes antabuse, disulfiram rather, what is it that's keeping them from drinking? Anticipation of a bad result. Right. I'm glad you said that. Anticipation of that. Not they'll vomit um, when they drink because keeping somebody from drinking is a step that's before they drink and vomit. So clearly there has to be a, an effect other than actually making them vomit when they drink. And it's, you're exactly right, it's the anticipation. So changes decisional balance, basically. And um, the anticipation of getting sick and having a certain immediate bad thing happen is very different from the usual one of um, alcohol and other substance use disorders where we're expecting someone to stop using a drug that they know has a definite positive benefit when they use it, a definite positive immediate benefit that when they use it, as opposed to an indefinite possible future bad thing that could happen. And when people are faced with that kind of decision, you know, we're really wired, we're not well wired um, to be good at making those decisions. It takes a lot of training and, and prefrontal cortical you know, function to be good at delaying rewards, at being able to prize uncertain future consequences versus certain... Pre so disulfiram brings the bad consequence immediate and definite as opposed to future and possible. So disulfiram has a neurocognitive effect through the anticipation. Um, some other effects of disulfiram actually may increase dopamine through antagonism of dopamine beta hydroxylase. The dose, 250 or 500, I never use 500. Um, there's controversy, you know, some people will teach, well, yeah, if they don't get sick on, you know, 250, increase the dose to 500. But to me, if they didn't get, if they drank on 250, then they've already proven to me that anticipation of a negative consequence is inadequate. Uh, for them, and yeah, maybe they won't drink the night, but but it's 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 just putting them at greater risk to give them now a higher dose, and they'll get sick. They've already shown that the attempt to change decisional balance doesn't work. So um, some people will insist on having another try, and then you know I'll prescribe disulfiram again. But um, uh, and these are the side effects again. Um, be aware of the very rare fulminant hepatic necrosis, the more common 1 in 200, 250 mild to moderate transaminase elevation. I've tried rechallenging, but it's probably not wise to rechallenge once somebody has had the transaminase elevation, it's probably best to stop. And then uh, VA DOD treatment guidelines say get transaminases before you start somebody and uh, repeat. Um, every three months. I mean, ideally, it's even nice to get a repeat one month after you start, but it's so hard to do that. But you should definitely monitor transaminases. Uh, pregnancy, uh, nursing are contraindications. Um, a caprosate um, is, has this glutamate modulating effect. It's, um, it's thought to reduce withdrawal-related dysphoria and to reduce that chronic 
post-withdrawal anxiety slash dysphoria. And it's one of the medications that's mentioned as uh, a possibly for the relief drinker. Um, nonetheless, um, it's, a, it's really difficult. Um, 666 milligrams three times a day with crazy big tablets are just really hard. And then um, further dampening my enthusiasm for using this medication um, is the fact that there's not a single American, meaning with the United States participants, not a single American study uh, with it that showed an intention to treat analysis that where a campersate separated from placebo. There isn't. Um, Project Combine didn't show a difference. Uh, Barbara Mason's large 600 patient study didn't show a difference, although on a secondary analysis with highly motivated patients, there was a difference. But, but European studies do show a difference, and the FDA approval was based on European studies, so it works, but it just seems less robust, and the adherence is a very difficult. Um, very safe, some diarrhea, as noted at the bottom, reduce the um, dose with marked renal impairment. Um, naltrexone, FDA approved first oral, then injectable. Um, mechanism of action, we've talked about blocks mu opioid receptors and therefore reduces uh, some of the dopaminergic effects of alcohol drinking and also of alcohol thinking, thinking about alcohol. And that's what, where we want it to be working um, actually both, because it has benefits for abstinence by reducing craving when you're thinking about alcohol use and you're getting endorphin release and dopamine-related um, stimulation, and reducing that is thought to lead to less use. But then we also want consumatory effects in terms of reducing the pleasure of drinking, that, and that's more important for people who actually want to use this for controlled drinking in a targeted way, um, and we'll take it to try to maybe not keep from drinking, but drink less. Um, and it may improve decision making, reduce the hypersalience of, I saw you come in, Mirza. Um, uh -huh. re reduce the hypersalience of alcohol cues, and hey, um, and uh, reduce impulsivity. Um, the oral once a day, the extended release monthly, there's absolutely no data on the, um, the, that one is better than the other. Um, a, a recent, I think I, I saw for the first time a, a recent uh, controlled trial of oral versus injectable, I think in a primary care population of, by uh, Joshua Lee at NYU, which showed equivalence, essentially. Um, but I think people, for people with serious mental illness, uh, I've studied this medication in schizophrenia, uh, people with poor adherence, and also, the injectable is easier to tolerate, believe it or not, than the oral. Um, the injectable is 300 milligrams a month. And what's the daily oral dose of naltrexone? 50. So 50 times 30 is 1,500 versus 300. So you're getting an average of 13 milligrams a day versus 50 milligrams a day, and you don't get the peaks and troughs, and people really do have less GI, headache, um, lightheaded. So I, I think the, the injectable is better tolerated. It's expensive, but it, it works. It gets medication into people. Biggest adverse effects, GI, nausea, cramping. But then sometimes also this headache, lightheadedness. Again, like with disulfiram, there's um, transaminitis, maybe in one in 200 people. And, and I probably would not re-challenge. Um, I haven't had good luck with that. Um, with the injectable, very rare there are um, injection site reactions. Again, pregnancy and um, lactation uh, nursing are contraindications. Predictors of effectiveness, um, maybe the, you know, again, having a reward versus relief-based drinking, the sweet liking, high craving, maybe male uh, sex, uh, maybe early onset, um, the hope for a genetic predictor unfortunately vanished, um, or at least the hope that one gene, the OPRM1 gene, the gene for the uh, mu opioid receptor that would predict, while there were a bunch of, of 
retrospective studies where we looked at data sets um, and there were investigations looking at um, post hoc analyses. Um, the, the first pre hoc study where people were actually genotyped and then randomly assigned to naltrexone or placebo based on which type of, uh, which alley they had for OPR1 showed absolutely no, no difference in who responded to naltrexone. We can use it in people who are still drinking, just like we can at Campersate, um, and monitoring, again, liver functions before. Ideally, it'd be nice to get liver functions a month after starting, but certainly three months and six months. And you, you know, you gotta be aware of, uh, you can't use opioids, if, especially if they're on the long acting, then you're kind of stuck. So pyramate, my opinion, currently probably the most effective uh, medication, just in terms of, let's, let's say, it's the most efficacious. Uh, so efficacy is in, you know, like in a pure state, how, how big a difference does it make in drinking? Effectiveness, you gotta factor in, people can't use this stuff because of side effects or adherence or whatever, but efficacious, it's probably the most potent of the alcohol pharmacotherapies. Uh, I gotta brag on this. We just finished, after seven years, the 12th last week in the 150th last participant, and uh, this, this is a study that you're painfully familiar with, Emily. Um, but uh, a study of PTSD and alcohol, a placebo-controlled study with topiramate. We, we haven't uncovered the blind yet. Actually, we did just uncover the blind this week, but I, I don't know yet what. But we're trying to confirm an earlier study that showed that topiramate reduced PTSD as well as alcohol use. But um, dosing is uncertain. It's probably somewhere between 50 and 300 milligrams, but you really got to go patient by patient. Uh, Han Kranzler at Penn is doing uh, currently a, um, a study to look at whether the GRIC1 gene is a predictor for response. I use it routinely in my UCSF faculty practice to look at genetic testing, and I don't start people on topiramate who don't have the, the right gene. That being said, it could prove like with OPRM1 that it's, <laughs> it's, it's worthless. It's a will of the wisp. It doesn't really predict. Lots of side effects, which is why having a genetic predictor would be helpful because people get memory problems, verbal fluency, short-term memory uh, problems, um, paresthesias, uh, numbness and tingling, some weight loss, increased chance of kidney stones. The only really dangerous thing is uh, very rare, um, one in 15 to 20,000 occurrence of uh, narrow angle or closed angle glaucoma. So pressure goes up in the eye, get pain, redness, vision trouble, you gotta stop the pyramid. Uh, this just shows the Blodgett meta-analysis from a few years ago, which in this meta-analysis, every single study except for one had a positive outcome. And there's no other alcohol pharmacotherapy that has that kind of meta-analysis. Um, so again, with uh, renal, uh, re renal impairment, uh, cut the dose by 50%. Um, that's a suggested uh, tapering. And then just going through um, all this stuff, there's some modest evidence for gabapentin. Um, and there's also some evidence for adding gabapentin to naltrexone versus adding placebo to naltrexone. There is at least one controlled trial that showed added benefit of gabapentin naltrexone combined over naltrexone alone. Gabapentin, it's like a third or fourth line drug, again, maybe for relief uh, drinkers with bad livers because it's renally cleared. Um, it's, it's quite helpful for sleep, and there are uh, a number of studies and a, a small meta-analysis that looked at gabapentin probably is the premier insomnia for people with alcohol use disorder medication. Um, also, um, many of us use it for anxiety in people with alcohol use disorders. Um, and unlike, uh, as the name would, um, um, it, it facilitates GABA transmission, but it is primarily a, um, an alpha-2 delta uh, subunit calcium channel blocker. Uh, so it does not affect the GABA chloride ion channel complex, but it has other inhibitory effects that end up sort of potentiating uh, GABA effects. Um, no clear predictors. Um, baclofen, you know, a lot of smoke. Um, again, it seems to work in Europe. It does not work in the United States. There have been 
several large, including a, a recent large VA study in EPC, patients, zero zip, nothing, no, no advantage over placebo. Uh, another large study out of Medical University of South Carolina from a couple of years ago by um, Bob Malcolm uh, and Ray Anton, again, zero zip, nothing. Um, Meta-analyses show not much in terms of uh, American studies, um, it's very popular in Europe, and there's sort of a backlifting cult. And it's really not clear, you know, is it, do you need very high doses, but that hasn't really been borne out, and there's some hazards with it. Um, but again, renally cleared may be helpful in some patients, sort of like a fourth, fifth, or sixth line uh, drug. Um, these are some other possibilities. So, is there a first line drug for alcohol? Well, it depends. If they're abstinent, we can use pretty much anything. Um, if they're still drinking, we can't use disulfiram. If they're using opiates, we can't use naltrexone. If they have really bad liver disease, we can still use all the hepatically metabolized drugs, but just be careful. If they have severe renal impairment, again, we can still use the gabapentin, topiramate, baclofen, um, acamprosate, but you gotta, again, cutting the dose generally in half. Um, and then, you know, these are, various genetic predictors that have been explored. This is just sort of food for thought. It's not really giving us anything um, specific. And there's so many unanswered questions, and they're listed in your handout. But even with medications that work, we don't know how long do you can, I mean, what would you say if somebody asked you, so how long, doctor, how long should I continue this alcohol use disorder relapse prevention medication? Um, well, well, no, <laughs> six to 12 months. You know, I, it's really like, who knows? Um, and numerous, you know, can we combine them? There's so little research on this stuff. Predictors, of course. Uh, there's some uh, tools and resources um, and uh, a couple of the more, uh, some of the more recent last few years, uh, recent best reviews for you to look at. Um, and I think we've, Finish right at two. <laughs>